know as of 2011, over 30 million American men and women over the age of 40 have overactive bladder. And that was 2011 data. So let's, you know, it's now 2023. So if I were to estimate, I'd say 35 to 40 million. That is a large, that's over 10% of the United States population. And we know that, that women under 65 are the predominant uh, sufferers of overactive bladder, but we look at actually over age 65, that changes to a male demographic. What's unique, I think, about the current landscape of OAB is we're getting more treatment options with better safety and better efficacy. So it's a win-win for the patient and the provider. Um, as of what we call beta-3 adrenergic agonists, uh, Jim Tessa of Vibegron is the generic name, uh, certainly has some good safety and efficacy data going all the way out to one year that we know in these clinical trials. Traditionally, we only had, you know, one, as far as 10 years ago, we only had one type of a receptor uh, mechanism for treating overactive bladder, which is anticholinergics. Unfortunately, now we know anticholinergics, aside from the typical side effects of, of maybe dry mouth or constipation, we now know that patients can suffer cognitive decline on these medications. And about 80% of patients with overactive bladder are already on other medications, maybe like uh, antidepressants, SSRIs, uh, beta blockers for hypertension. And so these patients are kind of not only possibly suffering cognitive decline, but maybe interactions with these other medications, which is when this new beta-3 adrenergic agonist class was born. Overactive bladder is defined by the International Continent Society as urgency, urgency episodes, frequency, which is more than eight voids in a 24-hour period, eight urinations, and then with or without um, urge urinary incontinence. So it is this, you know, OAB wet or these incontinence episodes. So that's not only socially embarrassing, um, but it's isolating for these patients. And so people can have any or a number or an, you know, an additive measure of these symptoms that may affect them. Uh, and then they develop all of these crazy kind of uh, really in, you know, in really inconvenient coping mechanisms, whether they have to carry pads when they're on a hike out or they go to a birthday party or a social event, whether they have to excuse themselves from their desk. You know, I think the COVID pandemic hit a lot of overactive bladder that we're seeing teased out in the community now because people had unlimited access to fluids and bathroom access when they're returning to the workplace or perhaps to their delivery routes, whether you know it's a postal worker or, or a service delivery worker, they're now having to find these coping mechanisms, wearing dark pants when their uniforms are khaki and they're, they're now having leakage. Where Jim Tessa fits into this treatment paradigm is, you know, in my opinion, this is a unique medication. So it's the only overactive bladder uh, medication with proven urgency reduction in the label from the FDA. It's allowed to be a crushable tablet, which for patients in the long-term care community or patients that can't swallow medications, it can be mixed with applesauce, a tablespoon of applesauce, and then used in that manner. And then also it's the only uh, beta-3 adrenergic agonist with no blood pressure warning in its label. And I think this is important because many patients have had these problems on other medications or with other medications that they're taking on a daily basis. I can only speak to data that's released uh, through the FDA, you know, phase three clinical trials at current and not either ongoing or, or 4C plan data. But I think there's, there's a couple of important things to see. When your advanced sciences looked at data in terms of getting this drug approved by the FDA for OAB and then also this urgency, uh, you know, reduction data, they looked at efficacy and they looked at safety. So from the efficacy perspectives, they did, a, they did trials with over 4,000 patients in different clinical trials, and they looked at two main things. They looked at 12-week or three-month data, and then they looked at an extension trial for safety and efficacy at the one-year mark. And what did they see? So they compared this to placebo. They compared Gemtessa to placebo or sugar pill. And at 12 weeks, we saw statistically significant differences in three things for efficacy. We saw a reduction in urgent urge episodes, which is that undeferrable need to void, which is the only one that has urgency reduction data in the label. So urgency, 
Number of voids, uh, mctricians, or what we call frequency, saw a reduction there compared to placebo at 12 weeks. And then also urge incontinence episodes. So we saw significant reductions in all of the overactive bladder domains, but certainly at 12 weeks, and then the extension study out to one year or 52 weeks, we saw reductions in urgency, frequency, and urge urinary incontinence, or what we call OAB wet. Um, in addition to that, a further study was undertaken with an active control medication. So that's a medication that's an anticholinergic that's been out in literature for decades. And again, saw statistically significant improvements in efficacy in those domains as well compared to an active medication. So Jim Tessa did not just statistically significantly improve this efficacy data in urgency, frequency, and urge urinary incontinence in placebo, but also with an active control. And that's difficult to do in the FDA to have almost like a head-to-head -head study. We don't see that done very often other than maybe oncology drugs. Um, and so I think it's important and, and really a landmark moment uh, that your advanced scientist was able to do that with Jim Tessa. I think it's important for providers to know that when we talk about, you know, efficacy with a new medication, obviously, aside from efficacy, you know, my first question is, is it safe? Does it work? And can my patients access, you know, this therapy? So in terms of safety with Jim Tessa, there were, you know, safety studies that were taken out to 52 weeks with this medication. And by and large, what we saw were a couple of things that I think are important for providers to know about safety. So with this new beta-3 adrenergic agonist medication, Jim Tessa, the most common adverse events, which are required to be reported to the FDA, which is greater than or equal to 2%, of the study population. Those were urinary tract infection, nasopharyngitis, um, headache, and upper respiratory tract infection. But I think most importantly to know, um, which is really you know, endorsed by a Choosing Wisely campaign when we talk about cognitive decline, is as, as a class beta-3 adrenergic agonist, there was not a cognitive decline seen. And then specifically when we talk about Jim Tessa, you know, it is the only beta-3 adrenergic agonist uh, that does not have a hypertension or high blood pressure warning within its label. And I think that's important for my colleagues in care to know.